Hello everyone, this is Dell Channel 21, and in this episode we'll be having a look at not just one, but two EVGA GTX 570s. And these are rather special 570s, as they are both equipped with 2.5GB of video memory. I'll put them through their paces not only in SLI, but also in DirectX 12 titles. First a little backstory. The DGX 500 series was launched in November 2010. Built upon the same Fermi architecture as the previous generation, the 500 series saw to fix many of the issues of the infamous Liat 400 series, as well as lift performance. The new GTX 580 did not only run at a higher clock speed, but now also utilized the full chip with 512 CUDA cores. Moving down, the GTX 570 now got the same 480 CUDA cores as the GTX 480 and run at a clock speed of 732 MHz, as opposed to the 48700. TDP was also reduced a bit, with the 570 at 219 Watt compared to the 250 of the 480, and the full chip 580 was still at 244 Watt. Unfortunately, the amount of video memory remained unchanged from the 470 and 480, with the 570 and 580 still only getting 1.28 and 1.5 GB respectively. Only weeks later AMD brought their new chips to the market with the Cayman powered HD 6950 and HD 6970 sporting an impressive 2 GB of VRAM. Back then I was in the market for a higher end GPU. The GTX 570 turned out to be a bit faster than the HD 6950, so that was the GPU I wanted. But I was worried that the 1.28GB of VRAM would become an issue in the future. Luckily there were a few manufacturers who offered special versions in which they doubled the memory to a whopping 2.5GB, the cards you're looking at right now, which cost 350 euros per card back in 2011. How's that for a higher end card now? Taking one apart, we can see that they are fairly standard in terms of design cooled by a quite conservative aluminum heatsink with three heat pipes and a centrally placed fan which blows hot air from either side of the card. Removing the cooler we are presented with the PCB where we can see the 10 memory chips in all their glory with the GF110 chip as the centerpiece. These cars only came equipped with a mere 4 phase VRM so aggressive overclocks are not recommended. What is certainly worth noting is that on June 29, 2017, Nvidia surprised nearly all of us with their 384.76 driver, which brought DirectX 12 support to all Fermi cards. While rumors had already been going around since 2014, nobody really expected the 2010 architecture to actually get DirectX 12 support. Unfortunately, while Fermi does support DX12 feature level 11.0, they do not support so in SLI, so I've only been able to test single card performance in DirectX 12. Well, it's time to turn our attention to benchmarks, starting with DICE's Battlefield 1, where I test the first campaign level at ultra settings. Here the single card averaged 33 FPS, and in SLI performance increased by 61% to an impressive 53 average. The 1% low score, however, still lagged behind at only 29. Turning on DirectX 12 saw a decrease in performance to 26 FPS average, and during my testing I noticed GPU usage was only at around 90% in DirectX 12. Looking at frame times in DirectX 11, the SLI setup produced quite some variance, but it was still consistent enough to not lead to too much stutter in-game. Next up is the ever-popular Grand Theft Auto V, where I drove a predetermined route through the city using the very high settings and 2 times MSAA and 2 times MSAA for the reflections. Performance was very impressive here. In SLI the average was a smooth 63 FPS. It was a whopping 75% increase from the single card, which still scored a playable 36 FPS. The 1% low on both configurations was impressive as well, and not that far behind the GTX N60. 
Looking at the frame times, the SLI setup did produce more variance, but apart from a few hiccups, it was smooth overall. Moving on to the 2016 Hitman. Here I tested the boat level using the medium settings and no AA at 1080p. While scaling was very good here, actually a 69% boost from the single card at 26 FPS to SLI with 44 FPS average, performance still left a lot to be desired. And turning on DirectX 12 only made things worse, now dropping to a 21 FPS average and 14 on the 1% low. Issues become even more apparent when we are looking at the frame times where both configurations suffered from severe stutter. Onto the Codemasters Dirt Rally, where I used the built-in benchmark using the Ultra preset. Performance was excellent here, with the single card averaging 46 FPS, and in SLI this improved further by 61% to a 72 average. With strong 1% lows this resulted in a great experience which is backed up by the frame times, which in both cases showed very little variance, and only very few and low spikes. Next for a DirectX 12 only title, where I tested the 2017 Halo Wars 2. Using the high preset at 1080p, it averaged 36 FPS average and 22 for the 1% low. As you can see here, there is a lot of funky stuff going on with the foliage, but the game did run okay-ish overall, although in foliage dense areas performance did drop to the mid 20s. I of course did also try lowering the settings, but this made almost no difference to performance at all, so I just stuck with high. In any case, this is an example of a title you can run thanks to the DirectX 12 support of Fermi, which wouldn't be possible on the competing AMD 6000 series of back then. So there's that at least. Can't do benchmarks without Crisis. So here I've tested Crisis 3 on the intensive grass level on the first mission, using the very high preset. Scaling here is very impressive. The single car scoring 29 FPS and performance jumped 76% in SLI to a 51 average with 30 FPS for the 1% low. Frame times were quite a different story, however, and the single card did quite well apart from a few hiccups, but SLI was a mess in general, with large spikes to over 70 milliseconds. Not exactly something I'd recommend playing on. Up next is another DX12 only title, Gears of War 4. Here I ran the build in benchmark at 1080p on the medium preset and averaged a decent 43 FPS average and 33 on the 1% low. It ran surprisingly smooth and frame times were quite consistent. Overall I'd say this DX12 game was the best of the titles I tested on Fermi. Onto Valve's Counter-Strike Global Offensive, where I tested the highest possible settings without AA on the revamped Dust 2 map. Performance was great here, the single card did a 132 FPS average, and in SLI this increased by 48% to 196, which I believe is also the point where we run into the limit of my 2600K, as I found out previously in my 2600K meets 240Hz video. Looking at frame times there were a few larger spikes, but in general it was very smooth. And last but not least, my personal favorite, the 2008 Grand Theft Auto 4. Not many people know, but GTA 4 does support SLI, although in the testing I did, it didn't make a whole lot of difference. I drove a predetermined route through the city, using the very high settings, with the sliders at 55%. The single card got 45 FPS average, and in SLI this improved by 18% to 53 and the 1% minimum also got a small boost to 25. Looking at frame times, they aren't very good, both producing a lot of spikes, but personally I was expecting a lot worse. In terms of video memory usage, while I don't have a standard 1.28 GB 570 to compare to, most games used over 2 GB of VRAM, 
any newest titles like Halo Wars 2 even saturated it. While Windows is known to use system memory when the VRAM is full, I doubt that that will be without a performance hit when some games are using over 1GB above the 1.28GB buffer. So I do think the double 2.5GB VRAM is allowing games to run at these quality settings. Looking at the synthetic benchmarks, I first tested 3D Mark Firestrike, and here the single GTX 570 scored 3845 points, placing it around the level of the GTX 750 and AMD RX 550. It does beat the GT 1030 by a decent margin, but I'd be quite sad if it didn't. Enabling SLI boosted performance by 64% to 6293 points, which places the two cards together next to the GTX 760 and GTX 1050. A pretty good result. It is worth noting that the other results you're seeing were run with different CPUs. This is more to give a general idea of performance levels. And the last test is the DirectX 12 3D Mark Time Spy. As with the gaming results, the 570 falls short here, scoring only 836 points. The previously equal scoring RX 550 now scores nearly 50% better than the GTX 570, and even the small GT 1030 now beats it by a good margin. In conclusion, I believe the data I have gathered for Fermi paints a two-sided picture. On one hand there are the titles, both old and newer, in which Fermi can still be quite relevant. Looking at say GTA 5, Dirt Rally and even Battlefield 1, they performed great, even with maximum quality settings. Dropping down to say high or medium will in almost all cases result in performance over 60 FPS if the game has good SLI support. On the other hand there are the newer, newer titles like Hitman and Halo Wars. Looking at those, I do believe time is beginning to catch up very quickly for Fermi, as shown by the low FPS and spiky frame times. The support for DirectX 12, while great that it exists, it just doesn't run well on this architecture. While it does enable you to play titles you otherwise couldn't, you'd just be better off with a slightly newer single card for those games. And that would also address the problems outside of performance being that this configuration is very loud, runs very hot at around 80 degrees Celsius, and uses a ton of power. This is still Fermi after all. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this episode, and I also hope I've managed to bring some insight into Fermi's performance in SLI in modern titles and in DX12. If you did, a like would be much appreciated. And if you have a comment or question, suggestion, or anything along those lines, feel free to leave one in the comment section or on Twitter. I have some very interesting other multi-GPU projects upcoming, so if you want to be kept up to date, please consider subscribing to this channel. Well, that was all, and bye-bye.